Oh, glory. It is good to gather together. The Bible says, do not forsake to assemble. There's a reason for assembling because we are. The word says that when revelation comes, we restrain evil within us. But when it doesn't come, the restraints are removed. So, so many times there's things that we do that we don't realize that we're doing because we haven't received fresh rhema or gotten revelation from God in a period of time. And that's where relationship is so important because, you know, you may get illumination or revelation by fellowshipping, which is important, but you want a revelation from God on your own, knowing that when he says something to you, there's confirmation and you just got revelation. And there's nothing greater to know that God is speaking to you and you're hearing. Amen. But you better make sure it's God. <laughs> Everybody around you may tell you a different story. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that's why it's good to have fellowship so that things are confirmed also. That's why we go to counsel for things that are confirmed. We want to know exactly what is really truth and what isn't. And there's something to that arena that the Lord has brought to my attention today because we've been talking about desires and, you know, there are things that connect to desires and emotions and, and impulses and things to that degree and the influence of making what is unseen to become seen to always know the fruit of what, what we're about to express so that we see things all the way through. Everything that we do, there should always be seeing it all the way through. You know, people go, well, why, aren't I predestined? Yeah, everyone is predestined. But, but you're not a slave. <laughs> you're not a robot. So everybody's been predestined in a certain arena to fulfill a call. But we still must cooperate with that call to fulfill it. So without cooperation, every time you're doing something, every step that you make, every decision you make is a step with an end result. Amen? Every decision you make, everything you do has got an end result because where there's a beginning, there's an end. Everything in this realm has an end no matter what. Is everybody okay? So every decision you make, every step you take, there's always a beginning and there's an end. If I choose, if something comes across my path and I choose to do this, there is an end result to it. If I do not see the end result of my decision, I'm blinded. And if you're not willing to look to the end result, you're deceived. So everybody got it? Again, every decision, everything that I choose to do with my will has an end result. We are to see things all the way through. If I am not seeing things all the way through, I'm blinded. So everybody got it? It's important. We must see every decision all the way through. One thing God doesn't do is interrupt himself. So if God has told you to do something and you choose to alter whatever you're doing because it's fulfilling something that you believe but not seeing it all the way through, then it's not God because God never, never interrupts himself. There's three wills of God and then there's the will of man. There's the good, acceptable, and perfect will. Then there's the will of man. Many people get themselves in trouble because they make a decision and never see it all the way through. And one of the reasons this begins to happen, the word tells us it blesses the man who overcomes temptation. And he talks about a desire that's been established. It's a seed of desire. But one of the things that motivates these things is called motive. Because where there is a desire, there is a motive. And there are hidden motives within each and every one of us that it's your responsibility and my responsibility to expose. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? 
If I am not exposing why I'm doing what I'm doing, then I am deceived. Has everybody got it? If I can't see it all the way through, then I am blinded. And that means there's an evil presence there in my life that is preventing me, and I'm allowing it to happen. You know, there's so many times that we do things and don't realize why we do them. There's times when we were all, I know that when I was out using and whatever, and, and I wanted to stop, but I couldn't stop. I knew that my only way to stop was death because that was the only thing I knew. My only way out was death. My motive was an evil motive. It was to fulfill myself. It was actually not knowing that I was fulfilling, feeding spirits and demons that were in me, but there was a need. I had a desire. My addiction was my mistress, my lover, my everything. It was my life. I could ask myself why I was doing what I was doing. I wasn't even sure why I was doing what I was doing because I, I didn't know the truth. But as believers of Christ and as Christians, by exposing your motive or monitoring your motive, exposing those hidden motives within us, it maintains us something called integrity. If we're not willing to expose these things, then we are not carrying the integrity of Christ. And that's what the world is looking for. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for his character. So everybody got it. In me and you to be expressed. And it's an expression of integrity. So we maintain this integrity of Christ by monitoring our thoughts, our words, our motives. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I making this decision? Why am I choosing this? And it's not on how you feel. Amen. In other words, if our motive is always to do the things that please God, <laughs> I believe you'd be in right standing. But if our motive is to please self, it's an evil motive. Now, don't get me wrong. There isn't, it doesn't mean that we can't go out and have fun. You can't go to the beach. You can't play volleyball. You can't fool around and and so that has nothing to do with it because God says be joyful and a joyful heart is good medicine. But even those motives, in other words, when you're doing sports, you don't want to cheat. <laughs> Hello? Amen. You know, and, and as humans, we are competitive and we have a tendency to want to cheat. <laughs> but we must look at our motive. Amen? We must monitor our motive. Turn to Jeremiah 17. As humanites, we like to do a shortcut to everything. We love drive through Because humanites are associated with the flesh. The flesh doesn't want to do nothing but feed itself. And Jeremiah 17... <laughs> you know, you can ask yourself, why am I here tonight? Why am I here tonight? Is my motive correct in being here tonight? Well, I have to be here tonight. <laughs> Good. That'll teach you. Why am I here tonight? What is our motive? Okay, so if, if we don't have a, 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 a pure motive or the right motive in being here tonight, will you receive? No. No. Why do I worship? Why don't I worship? What's my motive? Why do I speak everything I feel? Why am I not honest with myself? In Jeremiah 17 and 5, would you read it with me? Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in, him, in man 
and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not what? See when good comes. Now let me ask you this. He shall not see when good comes. In other words, he misses the things of God. But he's so, because the person is so caught up in fulfilling a hidden mode of self-agenda. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. That's pretty dry. Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and shall not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. So in this, we see that the heart is the character of a man's spirit. But in this, I want you to begin to look at when you see the word heart, it's also a representation of motive. The heart expresses motive. It's his motive. Your heart is associated with your motive. In other words, what's the motive? It's impulse, emotion, or desire that moves an individual to react according to the old way or respond according to the new way. What is my motive? Has everybody got it? I'll speak it again. It's impulse, emotion, or desire that moves an individual to react or respond. Impulse, emotion, or desire that moves an individual to react or respond. That's where the word motive, why? Because motivate. Motive associated with motivate. In other words, what's motivating you? What's, what's the force behind your desire? What's motivating you? What's your purpose? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? What cause, what purpose am I doing what I'm doing? Is it according to the will of God, the kingdom of God, or myself, or man-pleasing? So, everybody got it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I was watching the news today, and they had a congressional meeting about what they're going to do with Syria. Of course, they're about three or four months too late, but of course, there was a motive behind being late, and its purpose was to delay so that things couldn't actually get where they were supposed to get according to God's will but according to the will of darkness. But of course, all of that can be turned around, can't it? But I saw these individuals and the senators and so forth and the investigators, they were all telling why we should do something in Syria. And I, can, I sat back and I watched everyone's motive. And everyone, it was like a play. They already had it pre like everybody had their script. <laughs> everybody knew what they were going to do. I was a complete man. I thought, man, you might as well just shut the curtain and go to act two. But it was nothing but a, a play. Everybody had a script and why they should do what they do and when. Come on. This president hasn't called one congressional meeting to do what he was going to do. And now he chooses to do it. Why? Because he knew it would be a delay. And there's a purpose for the delay. But I'm not going to get into all of that. But I thought, man, does anybody see what their motives are? Can anybody really see what's really happening? You, you may see fruits of a person. But the motive may be hidden. You will see that if you're in the spirit. But you won't see that if you're in the flesh. 
You may discern the fruits, but you won't discern, discern the intent of the heart, and that is the motive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, let's read it. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found what? Faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Why? Because the Lord is always in front of him. So every, mo in other words, he's monitoring his thoughts, his motives, and his words. Because the Lord is always in front of him. That's relationship, isn't it? So he's allowing the Lord to judge him in everything that he does. Lord, every decision, everything he's doing, he wants to make sure that he's not interrupting what God wants to do. Has everybody got this? Now look at verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the what? hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. In other words, the Lord will judge us because he's before us all the time, every decision, everything we do. Because he's always saying, the counsels of the heart are the motives. What are the motives of my heart? So one of the things that we don't do is, in other words, he's saying, don't, Make the decision, judge, monitor the motive. And when you know that it's not right, don't make the move until the counsel of the Lord comes so that you make the right decision. Again, if you don't know what to do, don't do anything. Wait. Because one of the things that begins to happen is these hidden motives... The reason why we're impressed so much with darkness in the around, uh, surrounding areas of darkness is to try to promote a heart of rebellion. That's a motive, isn't it? It's a rebellious heart. It says, I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. it can't, uh, a, a rebellious heart cannot submit to the things of God. And it won't. It will have a partial submission. It will have a show of submission. But its motive, intent, is evil. So what it does is it puts on a show on the outward form of godliness. Goes to Bible studies. Does all kinds of things. All kinds of works. But its intent is still evil. Because it's not allowing the Lord to judge the decisions or the intents of the heart, the motives. That's why we have relationship with the Lord. That's what a Christian is, Christ-like, because he carries an integrity of Christ because his motives are pure, not evil. Is everybody okay? Genesis 6. That's why it's amazing to me that people who proclaim to be Christians don't repent. How can you have a relationship if you're a person that does not repent on a daily basis? You can't. Because the Bible tells us that we all sin. We sin every single day and sometimes every hour, every minute. Hallelujah. Whatever it may be. But as, as we go before the Lord, Lord, forgive me for anything I've done. Whether I've seen it, not seen it. And Lord, you know, my, my motive was wrong here. I monitored my motive and I, I made the wrong decision because it was a, the selfish one. I shouldn't have did what I did. Forgive me. Why, why did we do that? Because we didn't wait on counsel 
from the Lord. We just became anxious, as the Bible say, be anxious for nothing but in everything in prayer and supplication. Now some people go, oh, oh Lord, should I do this while they're doing it? <laughs> then they go do it. Oh, Lord, well, you know, I prayed about it. Yeah, well, you didn't get an answer. Because the motive was selfish. Selfish motives are evil. So everybody got it? Hidden motives. Genesis 6 in verse 4. You know, the Bible tells us that in the days of Noah will be associated with the Lord's return as, of, as is in, in the days of Noah. And in verse 4 it says, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. They were known as Nephilim. They were offsprings of um, the fallen angels that went into humans. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that what? Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. In other words, his motives were evil continuously. There was not a pure motive on this earth except for Noah and his family. And he said, I'm going to kill them all, man. And the Lord was very sorry that he made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So he flooded them. But remember, these were no longer offsprings of Adam. So everybody got it? They were offsprings of fallen angels. They were Satan's offsprings. They were Nephilim hybrids. Their intent was constantly evil. The only ones that were still offsprings of Adam was Noah and his family. And that's why they still survived. Is everybody okay? Evil motives. In 1 Samuel chapter 12. First Samuel chapter 12. In verse 20. Samuel was a prophet. He was the word of God to the Israelites. And Samuel said to the people, he said, Do not fear, you have done all this wickedness. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with what? All of your heart. In other words, heavy servant motive served the Lord with a pure heart that's a pure motive and verse 21 and do not turn aside for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver for they are nothing for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake because of it has pleased the Lord to make you his people Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him what? In truth with all of your heart. In other words, monitor your heart. Make sure you're honest with yourself. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. So in this, he says, serve the Lord with all of your heart. In other words, with, have a servant's intent, pure heart. Search the Lord with all of your heart. In other words, have a pure motive. In 1 Samuel 16.
1 Samuel 16. Let's speak it together in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending to Jesse the Bithamite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will what? Kill me. Now look it. The Lord had a specific intent and motive, didn't he? So what he was doing now, he told Samuel, okay, don't worry about it. I got a plan for you. So he says, but the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you to replace Saul as king. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? See, they feared Samuel because of so many times of their wicked deeds and their unclean intents. So when Samuel showed up, they feared. And he said peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord had said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart or his what? His motives. His motives. What's his motive? Is everybody okay? So the Lord is always searching your motive. Why are you doing what you do? In 2 Chronicles 25. 2 Chronicles chapter 25. Is everybody okay? I can share with you that there are things that we want to do, have a desire to do. But we must check our motive. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Where is the intent? What is the desire? What's the root of why I'm doing what I'm doing? Am I really being honest with myself? Because I'm not, and I'm not being honest with God. Am I exposing my hidden motives with the Lord? You know, God holds things back until you begin to expose them. You know, you may, you may be doing something for greed. You may be doing something for selfish needs. You may be doing something... And there's nothing wrong with doing something for money. Does everybody understand it? Because we work for month to get money to do things, right? But we're not going to manipulate people to get it. That's a wrong motive. We're not going to lie. We're not going to exaggerate. Those are all wrong motives. In 2 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 1, let's speak it together. More... Oh, wait a minute. Second Chronicles chapter 25. Let me get there. <laughs> okay. Ammonizah. Uh, Is everybody there? Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jeho Jehobian. Uh, Jehobian, yeah. Of Jerusalem. 
His mother's name was Lucy. <laughs> Jehorian of Jerusalem. And he did, now look at verse 2, read this with me. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not what they what? Loyal heart. Oh, man, check that out. He did right, what, in other words, he did all the works right and good. But the motive of the heart was not right. There was another intent. So everybody got it. And he did all the right things. He broke down this, that, and whatever. But then they went out to war, and what did he do? I'll tell you the end result, because I'm not going to read it all. The end result is they went out to war. They had victory in the war, but he brought back all the idols and set them up to worship. But he did all the right things. He obeyed God in this, 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 and this, but his heart was not loyal. Because the motive was not pure. It was still a selfish motive to get what the desire wanted. Does everybody understand that? Is everybody okay? Same thing as believers, you know, even in how we dress. If we dress lustfully, well, then there's a wrong motive there. That means you're hunting or you want to be hunted. There's nothing wrong with dressing nice with makeup and whatever. And, but when you start dressing not appropriate, there's a wrong motive. Does everybody got that? That means you want to be hunted. That is not pure. So you may do the things of God. You may worship. You may serve in ministries. You may do all kinds of things. But your motive is still not loyal. Is everybody all right? Go to Chronicles 30. Second Chronicles 30. In verse um, 13, you know, many, I've heard people talk about going to church just to find a mate. I'm not going to church and find me a mate. <laughs> you might as well open up a Cracker Jack box and see what's what. Well, I met her at church. <laughs> yeah, we got married. I met her at church. Well, I met him at church. For some people, a church is no different than a bar. That's right. Hallelujah. Verse 13. Now, many people. Now, many people. A very great assembly gathered at Jerusalem to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month. They arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem. They took away all the incense altars and cast them into the brook of Kindred. Then they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the 14th day of the second month. The priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought the burnt offerings to the house of the Lord. They stood in their place according to their custom, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood received from the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the assembly who had not sanctified themselves. Therefore, the Levites had charge of the slaughter of the Passover lambs for everyone who was not clean to sanctify them to the Lord. For a multitude of the people, many from Ephraim, Manasseh, 
Ezekar, Zublan, had not cleansed themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the Lord provide atonement for everyone who prepares his what? Heart to seek the Lord, the Lord God of his fathers, though he is not cleansed according to the purifications of the sanctuary. So Hezekiah was saying, Look at Lord, I know we didn't all get sanctified here. But I'm asking that as we eat the Passover lamb, as we celebrate this, that you would have mercy, not according to the traditions, but according to a man's heart. Because they didn't do the traditions. And verse 20, and it says, And the Lord listened to Hezekiah and healed the people because their motive was, was pure, not because of the ritual, not because of their works, not because of anything, but their heart, their motive was pure. Does everybody got this? You know, David made mistakes, didn't he? But what did, he, what did Dave, the Lord say about David? He was a man after my heart. He was a man after my heart. Is everybody okay? Go to Esther. So those who prepare their heart remove evil or hidden motives and they got healed. Esther. In chapter 6. Esther was the niece of Mordecai. And uh, she was a Jew. And she had gotten chosen to be the king's wife. And Mordecai, uh, being her, her uncle, had an encounter with a gentleman named Haman. And he was a promoted individual. He was out for selfish gain. And he came by Mordecai. And Mordecai, he wanted Mordecai to worship him. Mordecai wouldn't. And he hated the Jews because of that. Now, he didn't know that Esther was Jewish. She was the king's wife. So he convinced the king to approve a, 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 a decree that all the Jews would be killed because they were against him. Because Haman's desire was to kill Mordecai. So he was willing to kill all the Jews to get to Mordecai. Is everybody okay? So Esther found out about all of this and she was trying to get a meeting with her, her husband, the king. She couldn't just walk in. She'd be killed. Even though that was her husband, he was still the king first before husband but this is how God moves so Mordecai at one time exposed two enemies that were trying to kill the king so it was in the records it says in verse 1 that night the king could not sleep so what so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told Begathina and Teras, two of the king's eunuchs, the bookkeepers, who had sought to lay hands on King Asarua. So what is that? Right. The king. Verse 3, then the king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. So the king said, now, first of all, before we go any further, 
It says that the king couldn't sleep. Well, who woke him up? Dad Almighty. And the king said, who is in the court? Now, Haman had just <laughs> entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai. I love it. So he was coming in. Haman was coming in to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So Haman had prepared his gallows to try to get Mordecai hung because he hated him because he wouldn't worship him. So the, uh, uh, yeah, in verse 5, then the king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Well, Mordecai was like, whoa, whoa let me tell you, because you must be speaking about me. <laughs> now, Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, boy, do I got a plan for you, kingy. He said, let a royal robe be brought on, which the king has worn. And a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on the horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Boy, Mordecai thought he had it made. I mean, Haman thought he had it made. Thank you. So Haman thought he had it made, right? Then a king said to Haman, hurry. Take the robe and the horse as you have suggested and do so for Mordecai, the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. <laughs> so Mordecai had to bring him everything and then walk him around and proclaim that he was the king's favor and all of the wonderful things. And man, Mordecai was steam. I mean, uh, Hammond was steaming. He said, man, how, I was getting... I'm, the, that gallo up there is, I just prepared that to kill Mordecai. And the Lord, and, and here I am exalting him now. I'm in trouble. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. When Haman told his wife, Zeres, and all his friends, everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. In the long run, Esther finally got before the king and invited Haman and the king to a mini feast. And so she said to him <laughs> in chapter 7, Hallelujah. In verse 4, she said, For we have been sold, my, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. Then the king answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? And, and who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? What a motive. See, if you won't expose your motive, God will. And Esther said, 
The adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then the king arose in his seat in his, uh, in, in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before the queen Esther pleading for his life. For he saw the evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where <laughs> Esther was. Then the king said, well, will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? <laughs> I mean, this guy, you know, nothing work here. Man. God exposed his motive. As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's head. Now, uh, Harbonon, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows of the 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him on it. So they hung Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath was subsided. Now this all started with a greedy desire. Does everybody understand that? It was a, 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 a Hammond had a motive of greed, power, revenge, hatred. Greed, power, revenge, and hatred. Because Mordecai refused to worship him. And God exposed his heart and hung him. Psalm 95. Hallelujah. You know, again, if you look around the world right now in places where you're at, where you work, where you where you fellowship and so forth, if everybody would just begin to examine and monitor their hidden motives, there wouldn't be so much chaos. People would be honest with themselves and with others. You know, be honest. Don't manipulate. Be honest. Psalm 95, verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God. We are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice and not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. As in a day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said it is a people who go astray in their hearts. Why? Because their motives changed. And they do not know my ways. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Again, where a motive, where there's an unpure motive, unclean motive, there is no rest. Has everybody got it? There's what? No rest. It's a gotta do syndrome. Going astray in the heart, change motive from pure to unclean. From obedience to rebellion. The cause and purpose is to fulfill a selfish desire. In Psalm 101. Verse 4. Psalm 101. Verse 3. What does it say? I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the works of those who fall away. I shall not, it shall not cling to me. A perverse heart is a lustful heart. Shall, not, shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. In other words, it's a motive of lust. Has everybody got it? Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. Has everybody got it? Everybody okay? 
Look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Hallelujah. Verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? You know, I wonder if anybody hears it about when people hold back their tithe. Why has Satan filled your heart to hold back your tithe or your offering? While, while it remained, was it not, not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? In other words, they could have just been honest about it. And so look, we decided to keep part of it because we needed it for whatever, and we decided to put this, but they lied. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. You have not lied to men, but to, see, you may think that you're lying to someone because you're holding something back, but you're not lying to man, you're lying to God. Does everybody got it? Why? Because the Lord should always be before us, shouldn't he? Amen? And so what happened? Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Then they brought in his wife. Gave her the same opportunity, and she died. I'll tell you what, that happened in the church today. People will be running up giving their tithes and offerings. <laughs> Daniel chapter 10. Hallelujah. Again, we must be honest with ourselves by examining and monitoring our motive of who, what, and why. Why do I hang with this person? Bad company corrupts good habits and associations bring impartations. Why am I hanging with, why am I becoming friends with this person? Is there an unclean motive? Is there an area of a lustful motive? Is there an area of a hidden agenda? Is there an area of usage of that person? What is it? Why am I doing, why am I rebellious? You know, God sets rules and regulations and boundaries. People look at rules and regulations as control, but God uses them as boundaries to protect people. But it's amazing how many people just look at it as control and not a boundary of protection because the heart is deceitful and rebellious. And it's got an unclean motive. And again, if we don't expose it before the Lord, it will be exposed. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 10. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. And he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you what? Set your heart to understand. In other words, what was he doing? He was examining his motive. He was expressing, he was exposing his motive to humble 
from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your what? Your words. So in other words, he was exposing his motive. I was setting my motive. I was setting my heart to understand. I was exchanging my motive, my desires for your. In other words, we need to determine what we're doing is kingdom bound or selfish bound. Is everybody okay? In James 3. James chapter 3. Is everybody there? In verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter Envy and self-seeking in your hearts. Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Wow. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Amen. Again, greed, self-seeking, all of these things, unpure motives. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Expose them. Expose them. Expose the hidden agenda of your motive. In Psalm 41. Psalm 41. In verse 10 it says, But you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are well pleased with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. As for me, you uphold my integrity and set me before your face forever. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. In Proverbs 11. What was he talking about here? My integrity. In other words, upholding my integrity. Why? Because he keeps the Lord before him face to face. And he allows the Lord to examine his motive. In verse 3, 
or verse 2, I'm sorry. When pride comes, then shame comes. But with the humble is wisdom. But the integrity of the upright will guide them, and the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the blameless will direct his way aright, but the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright will deliver him, but the unfaithful will be caught by their lusts. And I'm going to close in Psalm 1. Let's speak this together. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Because if you walk in the counsel of the ungodly, will you have a pure motive? No. But stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Hidden motives. Expose them. Or it can end dangerously. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. Now, I didn't ask, the Lord's not asking you to expose everybody else's motives. <laughs> Hello? Expose your own. First pull the national grand forest out of your own knife. You can pull a tree trunk out of somebody else's. Amen? So, Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We ask the seed be protected and grow and bear fruit for your glory. Lord, we ask for your mercies and grace and we repent for hidden motives, evil motives. We ask that you expose them in our life that we may be severed from them and we may have a pure heart and clean hands and stand before you in truth, spirit, and in power. I pray tonight, Lord, that revelation and impartation will be established and that there will be a thirst and hunger to stand before you and a desire to know you. I ask, Lord, that you bless everyone that has been here and watching and all the people that are listening. I encourage you again to continue to walk the walk and grow and mature by using the eternallibrary.org. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and provide for you in every way. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. And everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. I want to thank all the listeners and the viewers. And for more teachings and resources, please visit us at theeternallibrary.org. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and heal you and uplift you because you're a new creation in Christ. And old things have passed away and all things are made new in Christ Jesus.